I've been asked to come and talk to you about writing and being a writer, because that's what I do for a job, right? And I've been doing it for about uh, 23 years now. Uh, the, the clever way to become a writer would obviously be to go to university, study journalism, writing, uh, creative writing, something like that. I got into it in a bit of a weird way, because instead of doing the sensible thing, I got into writing by becoming a stand-up comedian. What comedians do you like? That was the one representative that Michael McIntyre, I've asked them all, we love him. It's like a god to us. <laughs> He's fantastic, isn't he? But they, 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 do you watch Live at the Apollo? Yeah. Right, they, they, that's what I did for a job, you know, where, where someone's, you know, they're on stage, you go, right, here he is, Dave Smith, and you walk on stage, the audience go crackers, and then it all dies down, and you're just standing there with a the microphone, you've got to make these strangers laugh, you know, and it's a nerve-wracking job. What I didn't realise at the time was a big part of being a stand-up comedian is being a writer. Why is that? You've got to write your material, it's a script, you know, and I don't want to kill a comedy for you, but it's a script, you know, you've got to work out how, what you're going to say, make sure you get the words in the right order, make sure you don't give the punchline away too early. What happens if you give the punchline away? Doesn't work, yeah. You get to the funny bit and you go... <laughs> yeah, and you get that, nothing. <laughs> Just a couple of slow ones up the back going... <laughs> <laughs> That's no good, you want the bright ones that are paying attention laughing, right? So it's really difficult, you know, it's a, a big part of the job, which I didn't realise at the time. And then, you know, I thought, well, how do, how do comedians uh, generate their material? What most comedians do is they carry notebooks around with them, right? So if you stopped a comedian in the street, there'd be a phone, keys, and a notebook full of all these little ideas that occur to you during the day. They're like gold dust, you know. Um, this, this must happen to you, you know. They're, they're, I think the best ideas pop into your head when you're, not, when you're not expecting it, don't they? Yeah? Does this happen to you when you're walking along the street on your own sometimes? Usually happens, you know, when you're daydreaming, you walk along on your own, you'll suddenly go... <laughs> Yeah, this idea pops in your head. And then a minute later, it goes, doesn't it? And it's really frustrating. The same happens to me now. You know, I'm in mean, Tesco, he's pushing a trolley around, you know, just uh, staring into the cheese counter, and I'll suddenly go... <laughs> 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 and I'll get out my notebook and think, that's quite a nice idea, you know? And they're, you know, they're the premise of most stand-up comedy routines. There's a little idea that you take, the premise, and then you expand on it. It looks a bit mad in the middle of Tesco, standing there on my own going... <laughs> Parents are moving their children away. Get away from the giggling man, children. Get away. <laughs> but I know that if I don't, from experience, if I don't write these things down, I forget them. And I get home and I'm kicking myself, thinking, oh, that was a really good idea. Something that I later can work into something, you know, a bit bigger, uh, you know, like a routine. Uh, and uh, what, do you know, it's a, it's a bit, do any of you perform? Do you do any performing? Yeah, performing's great. You know, it's a fantastic way to make you bulletproof. You get on stage in front of people, you think nothing could be as scary as that. They, they say human being, the two things that human beings fear most in life are uh, public speaking and death. I mean, stand-up comedy, you can have both in one night if you get it wrong. <laughs> Trust me. Right? But it makes you bulletproof, you know. And by doing it, by, by overcoming that fear of performing, going on stage at big, you know, uh, rowdy uh, comedy clubs like the Comedy Store and places like that, you never know who's in the audience. So every now and again, someone will come up to me afterwards and pat me on the back and say, hey, Dave, that was great. Uh, I'm a producer on a TV show. Do you want to come on and work on our show? And what do you think my answer was? Yeah, you know, have any of you been on TV? What were, you, were you on the news going? <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's exciting. I'd never been on TV before, but suddenly you've got all the cameras pointing at you. You've got your, your mic on. You know, the whole room's focused on you. And they go, right, you ready, Dave? And you go, yeah. And they go, three, two, one. You don't want to stand there and go, <laughs> and not know what to say. You've got to be organized. And you do that by writing it carefully, learning it, polishing it, rewriting it, until you get it absolutely spot on so that you do it in front of the camera really confidently. And hopefully, you know, it, your, your reputation spreads and other TV companies uh, start calling it. And I've, I soon made that connection that writing can lead to lots of other things as well. This writing that I was doing at home, you know, writing my, my stuff to do on stage, was leading to other opportunities. Just as an example of uh, where, where it can lead you, when you were younger, did you used to watch uh, In the Night Garden? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was nearly Iggle Piggle. Do you know Iggle Piggle? Yeah, yeah? what's he have in his hand? Blanket. If I'd got the job, I wouldn't have had a blanket, I would have had an axe. <laughs> I'm going to get you back up, back up. <laughs> I would have brought a whole new thing to it. But at least these opportunities were coming my way. You know, I got an interview with Red Doll Productions who made in the night. Oh, they made the Teletubbies. Do you remember Teletubbies? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having a Teletubbies flashback there. Oh, when I was young. Uh, <laughs> but I, I made that connection. I thought, well, I'm going to continue this because it's leading to that, these other interesting opportunities. I started writing for magazines as well. Do you read magazines? Yeah, what magazines do you read? New Scientist. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of laughs in New Scientist, I've heard. Yeah. Anything else? 
The week, yeah, the week's fantastic, isn't it? But I, do, you know, I, do, I thought, when I go into a news agent, so I look at all those magazines, even the weird ones down the end, like you and your goat. <laughs> they, they all need writers, and they don't just use the people that work there at the magazine, they use people like me, a freelancer. You know, the freelancer is someone who, you know, sits at home and writes, and it's just brilliant. The best part about my job is I haven't got a boss. I'm married, but that's different. <laughs> it's not like that at all, she's lovely. But, you know, you get to make your own time. I can work at mid I can start at midday if I want to, I can start in the evening, it's a nice thing to do. So I wrote columns for magazines, for women's magazines, that you might read, that your mothers might read, like Cosmopolitan, Company, She, Red, have you heard of these magazines? Yeah? yeah? I wrote, like, the man's column, you know, so you'd, you'd go through and there'd be loads of articles written by women, and you get to a certain page, there'd be a picture of me at the top, my name in big, bold letters, and then my opinion about something. And the brilliant thing about that is you can't be wrong with an opinion. It's just how you feel about something. And you just get to express yourself on page, I mean, on paper. And then, and then <laughs> at the end of it, you get paid. Hurrah. Does that sound like a nice job? It is. For a while, I had a column on a magazine called Pregnancy and Birth. <laughs> it was an odd magazine to write for. But at the time, my wife was expecting our first baby. So I wrote what it was like to be, you know, I was an expectant dad. So one month, I wrote about... Uh, de you know, decorating the spare room and building the cot and hanging up mobiles and all that kind of thing. And the next month I wrote about going pram shopping. If you want to know the difference between men and women when they go pram shopping, go into one of these big mother care type shops. Look at the couples in the pram department and you'll see the women in there quite rightly doing sensible things, you know, looking at the safety straps on the pram, the weather protection, and the men will just be standing there with the pram going, how fast will it go? <laughs> <laughs> Checking out other men in the shop going, yeah, you want a piece of me? Yeah. <laughs> But that's an example of a premise, right? Something that I might have, you know, in the shop, I might have thought, well, that's quite a nice idea. I've got more to say about that. So I would have scribbled it down and thought, you know, difference between men and women, pram shopping. And then you expand on that idea and you, you go, and this is, you know, the, the part of getting over that blank page feeling. You just expand on it. It's like having an idea and putting it under a big magnifying glass or a microscope and thinking, right, what more have I got to say about that? And you, you, you know, and it grows. So I might talk about, you know, what, uh, what men are like buying baby clothes or baby toys or what are men like, you know, broaden it out to what are men like shopping generally. Do you see what I mean? Yeah? And it's just, you know, it's not rocket science, just, you know, it, broadening these ideas. That magazine, <laughs> Pregnancy and Birth magazine, thought it would be a really good idea for me to find out what it was like to be pregnant. So they sent me an empathy belly. Do you know what these are? It's like a fake belly that you wear. So they sent me this. <laughs> It's a very, you know, we're talking about diversity. It's a very diverse job that I have. The postman arrives and a kind of, I think this is yours. <laughs> so put this thing on like that, and it's got this big bump like that that you fill with water, so it goes bloop, bloop, bloop from side to side. And then you put these weights in it, right, to, to make it, you know, give it some weight and make it hang down. So I had to try different things around the house, like, you know, getting off the loo is really difficult because you're kind of like this. And, yeah, stuck. <laughs> getting in and out of the car is really difficult. Uh, you know, get, getting off the bed is really hard. My neighbours already think I do a bit of a weird job, but they look in my window and I'm standing there going, <laughs> not long now. <laughs> but the point is, you know, I always thought when I was your age, if someone had said to me, even though I was good at English, I wasn't brilliant, you know, but I was quite good at it and I really enjoyed it. Uh, if someone had said to me, Dave, you know, you should be a writer when you're older, I probably would have thought, oh, I don't know, it sounds like a bit of a fusty, dusty job, like you're stuck in an attic writing, you know, kind of serious stuff, and it doesn't have to be like that, and it's not, it doesn't have any less worth, because it's, you know, it's humorous, all the stuff I write, you know, is with a humorous kind of angle to it, but it do doesn't make it any less, less uh, worthy, you know, because it's, uh, you know, it's not fluff, just because you're uh, writing humorous stuff. I did a lot of travel writing as well, travel writing, does that sound like a nice job? Yeah, does it sound like a nice job if I tell you you have free holidays? Yeah, suddenly everyone wakes up, oh yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, free holidays, you know, and it's, I thought this is absolutely brilliant. You know, I go, and this is how it works. If you're going to somewhere like Lille in France, which I went to, you phone the Lille tourist board, they say, you, know, you say, look, I'm, I'm writing this article for, uh, I wrote for the Boston Herald, an American newspaper. So look, I'm writing this article about Lille. Um, can you help me out? And they said, yeah, sure. And they put me up in a hotel. I had to get there on Eurostar. So I phoned Eurostar. They gave me two free tickets. So I went with my wife, we had a lovely free holiday in Lille, you know, I had a fantastic time. I did loads of research on bars and restaurants. <laughs> Came home, and I thought, well, that was brilliant, you know, and I just wrote about it in an entertaining way. And, and then, you know, so you press send on your email, it goes over to the, uh, the Boston Herald, and they, they, you know, and then you get a check, you get paid for having a free holiday. Is there any downside to that? Has, has anyone been outside Putney? A few at the back there going, there's an outside. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's a big world out there. 
But it may, you know, there, there, there is, it's, it's such a broad thing, being a writer, you know, it doesn't have to just be uh, uh, writing, you know, writing, book, writing books is a brilliant thing, but it's not something uh, I've got in, involved in yet. Um, TV as well, everything you see on TV, what TV shows do you watch that make you laugh? Sorry? Say that again? The news? <laughs> yeah, it's a real barrel of laughs at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> Brexit. Uh, <laughs> No, they're, they're, things like Mock the Week, do you watch that? And uh, Have I Got News for You? Things like that. You know, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. But, you know, I'm not taking anything away from the brilliant comedians on there. You know, it's fairly well written and rehearsed, you know, so that they get it right. And, uh, but you still count as a writer being on those shows. I did a lot on Radio 4 as well. Radio 4 is just fantastic. Because, you, you know, you write something, you go into the studio with your piece of paper that, you know, you've, you've taken care of and honed and polished. You know, and you go in and you sit down and a big green light comes on next to you, which means speak now. You read out your words, and that's how it goes out to millions of people. So if you're all about the words, like I am, you know, that, that's, it's, you can't beat that, because it's, it's your words and in your voice, which is just a fantastic thing to be able to do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been, this, this was 22 years ago, and how it started was like this, right? I, was, uh, I had a regular job. I was working in an office, which was fine. I liked it at the time. I got made redundant, right? So I didn't have a job, which really focuses you. You know, you're, I mean, I'm scratching my head thinking, what am I going to do with myself? You know, I need to, I want to do something that I enjoy, right? I just don't want to do something that I just fall into. So I was in Canada, right? I was in Montreal, in the city. I was on my own. I was looking through a newspaper for something to do that night. I wanted to go out, you know, in this amazing city. And uh, I, I looked at the comedy listings, you know, to see what was going on, because I enjoyed going to watch comedy. And it said, uh, the comedy works, comedy club open night. So I thought, I'm going to go and have a go. You know, I've always, I've always, I was always one of these people sitting in the audience thinking, you know, I could do that. That must be amazing. And I'm going to give it a go. So I turned up at this club, right? It's absolutely packed. There's about 200 people in there all going crazy, you know. And, uh, and I found the manager, a guy called Jimbo. And I said, hi, my name's Dave. And, uh, and I said, can I get on tonight? You know, can I have a go? And he had this clipboard. And he said, uh, oh, no, man, he said, you have to come back in a few weeks. It doesn't work like that. You know, you have to book up in advance. And I said, oh, that's a shame, you know, because I'm going home tomorrow. And he said, oh, are you a comedian back home? And I just went, yeah. <laughs> that was the turning point, right? Just, you know when words just pop out of your mouth, you go, hmm, what have I done? <laughs> and he said, he's suddenly my best friend. He went, come on in then. <laughs> and he said, you know, we, we'll give you, you know, there's, uh, there's uh, like eight guys on tonight, but, you know, we'll give you uh, number four slot. That's the best slot for someone like you. I was going, you have no idea. <laughs> and he gave me the slot, and then... Worst thing, I was standing at the back. The first, the first three guys go on. You know, they're all doing about 10 minutes each. You know what tryouts are, don't you? Like open spots. First three guys go on. The first guy goes on, great. Second guy, third guy, they're all really good. The crowd are going crazy. You know, they're really sort of pumped up about it. The compare goes on stage and he says, uh, he says okay, everyone, uh, you're having a good time? And everyone's like this. And, uh, and he said, uh, because, you know, the, the three guys you've just seen now are amateurs. Got a bit of a treat for you now. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction at the back, just going, don't say that. <laughs> at the back. He goes, here he is. He gave me this massive build-up. Here he is, all the way from across the big pond. Give it up for Dave Smith. So I walk through the audience, right? They're all grabbing me, going, yeah. I get to the front. You've, you've seen things like Live at the Apollo. You can tell how confident or how good someone's going to be almost by how they walk on stage, can't you? you know, they're confident. They know, you know that it's in their office space. This is my space. You know, I know what I'm doing. I must have walked on like this. <laughs> Absolutely petrified. And I stood there, and the worst thing, the most embarrassing thing that makes me cringe to this day is that the compare, the guy that was introducing us all, was a little guy, right? So he had the microphone in a stand about this high. I was so inexperienced, I didn't know that you could take your microphone out of the stand. <laughs> so I'm quite tall. I stood and did my whole act like this. <laughs> but it was okay, you know, it wasn't brilliant. I got a few good laughs, a few kind of silences where nothing happens at all, you know, but I thought... I, I kind of, it was average, it was about a six, five or six out of ten, but it gave me that, that, that impetus. I thought, when I got home, I thought, this is what I want to do. I can do this, you know. I can, get, I can definitely get better. And I've got better just by doing it, right? I wasn't very good at the beginning, you know, like most of us are. When you start a job, you're not very good at it. Same with writing, you know, I've got better at that just by doing it, you know, doing it again and again. I look at stuff that I did two years ago, and I think, I'm much better than that now, just by doing it. You know, I'm, I'm not a trained writer. You know, I studied German at uni, the mother tongue of humour. <laughs> <laughs> but I got over that, <laughs> it, still, it still worked out, just by doing it, right, and, by, 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 and, and, and also this desire to do something that I enjoyed. And if you find that sweet spot of something you enjoy, something you're good at, and something you get paid for, 
that's the magic, that's the holy trinity, isn't it? That's the magic, you know, the magic number, isn't it? The, those fir, those, the sweet spot, you find those three things and you're, 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 you're laughing. Not like that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I thought, I thought I'd get there eventually. <laughs> I'll just stare at you for long enough. Um, and I'll tell, I'll tell you about the, 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 the weird, you know, people are quite often say, you know, what, what's your worst ever gig? The worst gigs are not, not ones, that, I've never been booed off or anything like that. The worst ones are the weird ones that you just can't understand. Third gig I'd ever done, it was at this quite, quite uh, notorious club that was quite rowdy. First guy had been on stage and he got booed off, right? So I'm standing in the wings just going, oh no, oh no. He gets booed off, the, the compere, you know, introduces me. I'm absolutely petrified, I'm shaking, you know, cause it, with fear. And uh, I start doing my act and it was getting laughs. And I thought, wow, you know, it's working. And that threw me, because <laughs> I wasn't expecting to go so well. What I didn't realize is, because I'd never used a microphone before, I'm holding the mic like this. I was making this noise, right? This microphone was picking up the noise. I was standing there going, Because <laughs> <"Wee." laughs> the audience could hear it. They all joined in. They're all going, <laughs> But it was okay. It broke the ice, because suddenly, you know, because I relaxed, I thought, you know, I had a bit of a laugh about that. It broke the ice, and I remembered what the material was I was supposed to be doing, and it kept, came back to me, and it went okay. And I came off, and afterwards, the, the guy came up to me and said, uh, that was great, Dave, the way you handled that. It's brilliant. I'll give you a paid booking, and that's how it started. You know, I start getting paid gigs, and then it all led to these other things for writing for magazines, newspapers, TV, radio. But it all starts. It started with just making a choice, a quite a brave choice, getting out of my comfort zone, and having a go at something that was potentially quite scary. So, thank you very much for listening and laughing in the right place. That was uh, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs>